The battered ship was towed to the coast of a island nation in the South China Sea. It was being pulled by a Coast Guard vessel and on board this beat up boat were 200 very frightened refugees. For days they had been at sea, surviving a horrible storm which actually sank one of the ships in their convoy, surviving a pirate attack which left them with a hole in the hull of their ship that had been taking on water, um, surviving hunger and thirst, all for one purpose, for freedom. But their quest was not over, for now they were interned as refugees in a foreign land in a refugee camp. In one of the tents there, a man lay sick with malaria. His wife stood by with her two young sons, her one-year-old daughter, and a baby on the way. And she prayed desperately, because if he died, she didn't know what she'd do next. They'd been waiting for months for sponsorships to arrive from any free nation that would take them. But now, hope was drifting away, just as his life was fading. By the grace of God, Christian aid workers arrived at that camp, bringing with them life-saving medicine and blood transfusion, which he so desperately needed. The man lived, and he was able to see the birth of his third son. Around that same time, by God's providence, sponsorships arrived from churches in the United States. After months of waiting, this family would finally get the chance to leave the refugee camp and move to America. They had been fleeing persecution from a communist country, and their hope was that their children could grow up somewhere where they could follow Christ without the communist propaganda, without the atheistic agenda, somewhere where they could have faith. In celebration of all this, uh, they chose to name that baby boy Fug, which means blessing. They were so blessed that all this had happened. Now, once that little boy started school, they decided, you know, that name could easily be mispronounced, so let's rename him Peter. And uh, he grew up to become a skilled and erudite surgeon. So. <laughs> Everything in that story was true, except for that last little bit of hyperbole. <laughs> it uh, illustrates my point that Christian hospitality can be used so powerfully by God to change a family's destiny, to change individual lives, to change eternal outcomes. Our passage today is from Romans 12, 13, but I cannot preach this passage in a vacuum. For those of you who were here last week, uh, Pastor Ken preached from Romans 12, 12. And if you did not hear that message, or if you did not learn from that message, I beg you, go back, pull up the YouTube, dig into it. Because until you get Romans 12, 12, you will completely miss the blessing and the point of Romans 12, 13. If our hope is not founded, if our faith is not founded in a future hope, if it is not forged in patience under tribulation, if it is not fueled by prayer, nothing you do afterwards will matter. All the Christian hospitality you show, all the sacrifices you make, traveling around the world to a malaria-infested refugee camp will mean nothing if you don't have that agape love that pastor was preaching about. So that's my prescription to you for starters. If you don't get Romans 12.12, 12, I'm gonna break out my prescription pad, I'm gonna write down, Redose, Romans 12, 12, take as needed, refills, infinite, go. Okay, that, that's your assignment. <laughs> After that, then let's dig into this passage together. Uh, Romans 12, 13, open if you will. Let's, let's read God's word together. <clears throat> Contribute to the needs of the saints and seek to show hospitality. Today's message is not going to be a to-do list of how to check off this verse. Today's message is not going to be a self-help message on how to feel good about showing hospitality. Um, if I don't put Christ on display through this verse today, I have failed you miserably. So let's ask him for his help and let's dig in together. Jesus. 
showed love to sinners like each one of us, desperate, poor, and naked, and pitiable. You are a God full of mercy, full of generosity. And we pray that your spirit would be present today, that you would convict and that you would change, and that we would go forth being your vessels, carrying this good news, joyfully sharing hope, contributing to the needs of the saints, and showing hospitality in your name for your glory and for the good of others. Help us to learn today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you've been showing hospitality, as I know many here at Southside do, then I'm here to cheer you on. Keep living, Romans 12, 13. If you are scared or think that you don't have anything to offer, I'm here to build you up. I want you to start living, Romans 12, 13. And if your love has grown cold, if you feel complacent or cynical or even apathetic, I'm here to tell you, I've been there. Others have blessed me by living out Romans 12, 13, and I'm a different person because of it. I invite you to come journey with me as we dig into this. Now, as it happens, these tiny verses that we try to unpack in a large way can get a bit ungainly. So many different stories and examples. So to help you keep it organized in your mind, I've created a a brief acrostic that might help us stay on the same page. If someone asks you out to a meal, they might say, hey, let's, let's go grab a bite. So that's our word for the day, bite, B-I-T-E. We're going to explain what each of those letters stands for, and I hope that helps you follow along. So let's start with the first letter. You may recall the Christians, Christian men's organization, Promise Keepers. Um, one year they were going to hold an event in Syracuse, New York. And it so happened that at Syracuse University, was a professor, a tenured professor of English, focused on feminist theory. Uh, her name is Rosaria Butterfield. She was an open, openly practicing lesbian, researching the religious right and their politics of hatred against gays. So she wrote an uh, opinion piece in the local newspaper against the upcoming Promise Keepers event. Also in Syracuse, in the uh, Reformed Christian Church, was a pastor named Ken Smith. One of his parishioners walked up, slammed down the newspaper article, said, wait, what are we going to do about this? Well, later on, Rosera Butterfield is opening up her mail, and there's hate mail and there's fan mail. It's all the same to her. But she said that amongst the mail was the kindest, most intelligent, most intriguing letter of opposition that I've ever received. I just couldn't dodge it. There was an integrity to it. In the letter, Pastor Ken had invited her to call him and have a dialogue, and she finally did. Secretly, she was hoping to find fodder for her research on why Christians hate gays, but as she's speaking with him and he's graciously answering her questions, uh, eventually the conversation gets to the point where he says, you know, would you like to come over for a meal? My wife's a great cook, let's hang out. And she does. And that was the start of a long relationship where meal after meal, conversation after conversation. He continued to display Christ to her in a loving way. One of her quotes, they saw me as a human being, that I had dignity and worth just because I'm a human made in the image of God. You have worth not because of what you do, but because of who you ontologically are. You may know the end of the story. She now lives with her husband, a pastor, and their children, and she wrote, The Secret Thoughts of an Unlikely Convert, an English Professor's Journey into the Christian Faith. The journey spanned years. The journey spanned hundreds of meals. Rosaria said, after about 100 meals, we'll have a meal, a very lively discussion. Then at some point, the discussion would end. The Bible and the Psalters would come out. The Bible would be read and expounded. People would ask questions. We would pray and we would leave it there. And I realized that when you don't have faith, you have no place to leave your anxiety. Do you think that this brilliant, tenured professor in her circles, in her college environment, would ever have learned that about Christians if she hadn't lived that side by side with them in their homes, if they hadn't been genuine and open and vulnerable about their anxieties? 
Now, she's been doing this for months and months, hundreds of meals, and she recognizes she's no benefit to Ken and Floyd. She's not going to serve in their church. She has no sign of being useful to them. And yet, quote, Ken and Floyd don't throw people away. There was no reason for Ken and Floyd to spend that much time with me. And maybe, if Ken and Floyd don't throw people away, maybe that's part of the Christian ethic. Ken and Floyd did something that was the most amazing thing in the world. They let somebody like me into their home to actually see the way Christians live, not because they were all cleaned up. Things were happening as they were, and they let me watch. So that's what B in my acronym stands for, break down barriers. When you show hospitality to someone, they might have come to you with preconceived notions. They may have come to you with a brick wall of hatred towards God, but this could be your first step to breaking down that wall. I know because I experienced it in my own life. During my first deployment to Afghanistan, we were in what's called a village stabilization project. The idea being, we want to sway public opinion in favor of the rightfully elected Afghan government instead of in favor of the insurgency of Al Qaeda and the terrorists. So we're living in this valley in some a few mud huts, surrounded uh, by enemies on all sides, and trying to make it look like we're not an occupying enemy force. We wouldn't fly the American flag. Instead, we were there side by side with the Afghan National Army. Our soldiers would conduct patrols with theirs and just try to garner goodwill from the populace, saying, hey, we're here supporting you and protecting and defending, you know, winning hearts and minds while they're trying to blow out ours. So uh, for me, I'm getting pretty cynical and skeptical of the entire thing. I've seen too many soldiers lose their limbs, lose their lives. For what? I was hardened and doubtful. And I was self-defensive. I did not want to be another statistic, another one of the stories of green on blue, where some Afghan soldier turns on an American soldier and you read about it in the news. So I kept my distance, for sure, and uh, wouldn't eat with the Afghan soldiers, wouldn't hang out with them. Um, just became a real gnarly dude, as Pastor would say. Preach! <laughs> so true. I, I remember uh, one of our team leaders, Eric, orthopedic surgeon, a good buddy of mine, he said, hey Peter, you know, when General Mathis said, be kind, be polite, be professional, but have a plan to kill everyone you meet, you didn't have to take it so literally. <laughs> and this is coming from a guy who had been shot in the leg by the Afghans, and I had to stitch him up. If he could be forgiving, that was a lot more than I could be. I wasn't being understanding or compassionate. I wasn't being a witness. It was all about my pride and my self-preservation. Now fast forward a few years, and I'm back in Afghanistan again. Uh, and there was this one mission that really got to my heart. We were uh, going to infill with the MARSOC team, Marine Special Operations, what used to be known as uh, Marine Force Recon. The official reason why our medical team was going to provide some medical training for the Afghan National Army in that city, there may or may not have been some unofficial reasons for our team to be there. But anyways, we had a brief tour of the barracks and uh, did some medical training and things like that. And to be honest, I wasn't that interested in teaching these guys. I was busy watching for threats and suggesting sniper positions to one of our teammates. But the funny thing is, after all this is wrapping up, I thought we were just going to pack up on the helos and get out of there, but no. The team leader starts divvying us up, says, hey, you go with them, hey, you go with those guys. Peter, go, go, go with this crowd. I'm like, what is going on here? Oh, they're, they're serving lunch. But we don't have a room big enough for everybody, so you're going to go to their individual rooms, hang out with them, they're going to bring food, you guys are going to have lunch together. What? <laughs> uh, do I get an interpreter? Nope. So you want me to go with them into one of their rooms by myself? Yep. And eat lunch? Yep. <sighs> okay, fine. So, here I am, sitting in there, trying to be polite, and uh, they were friendly. You know, they were 
None of them spoke English. I didn't speak Pashto or uh, Urdu or whichever language it was that they happened to speak. But, you know, food starts getting served. It turns out it's like the most amazing roasted lamb I've ever had in my entire life, before then or since. And though it seemed random how we were assigned to different rooms of soldiers, uh, I, I think it was God's providence. These, were, these particular soldiers I was with were Hazaras. If you know anything about the cultural history, which, why would you? Um, the Hazaras are an ethnic minority with very Asian facial features because of their Mongol descent. When Genghis Khan was sweeping through the area and conquering everything, he left behind some kids. So, um, you know, they, the leader, he smiled at one point during the meal. He pointed and he said to me, you, Hazara, because I realized I do look like them. They do look like me. <laughs> you know, so much so that they just assumed I was one of them. And that was humbling. You know, I, I, all along I'd just been keeping my heart locked up. I had this barrier. And these guys were being humane and warm and inviting and welcoming. They were showing hospitality to a jerk like me. I was, I was broken by that. I could see their humanness, and I could see my ugly pride. And what I could no longer do was I could no longer hate them as an impersonal enemy. I still need to grow in compassion. I still need to grow in forgiveness and trust. There's still a lot of junk in me to clean up. But God started a change in me. And it started with a meal. That's the power of hospitality. When you invite someone for a bite, you may break down a barrier. The next letter of our acrostic is the letter I. Ask most anybody in church, how you doing? And they'll say, I'm, I'm doing fine. Yes, just fine. Um, that's our, our canned answer. I, I knew a doc, he was bit of a jerk, but if you ask him how he's doing, he would not answer, because he knows what a rote question and a rote answer it always is. Um, so something my wife and I did early on in our marriage is we started having people over to our house, whether it's for a small group or for a meal or something, and to the best of our ability, by God's grace, we tried to be open and honest about how we're doing, how's marriage going, what are some of our struggles, and things like that. And that, I remember one day we had this perfect couple over. I mean, he's a handsome, strong guy, his wife, lovely, charming lady. They look like they have it completely all together. And as we're sharing in the private setting of our home, she starts crying. She starts shedding tears, and they start opening up about their own lives, what's really going on under the surface. You see, you can gain insight into people's hearts. That's the letter I. It won't happen, though, if you keep the relationship safe and superficial, if all you do is, on the street, ask someone how they're doing. But when you start to genuinely show hospitality, when you start to sincerely reveal your heart, you can gain insight into other people's hearts. They'll feel safe opening up to you. Um, just a, a lighter example of that, we've been going to Southside for about nine years now. And when we started, one of the first people we met was Teresa Vintage. And uh, we met, I remember it was at a Bible study at the Davis's house. She would go on to teach our kids in Sunday school. You know, we've seen each other hundreds of times here in church, but we didn't really get to know her better until most recently, in the last few months, when we started doing a fellowship meal dinner group with her and several others from the church. Isn't that interesting? You can know someone for almost a decade, but not know them. If you want insight into people's hearts, I strongly urge you, in the name of Christ, show hospitality. Another example from some missionary friends of mine, Andy was the best man in our wedding. And Andy and his wife, Amy, they provide medical care to refugees in a Middle Eastern country. They've been there long term with their three children for a decade now. 
I remember during one of their first uh, years in that country, the month of Ramadan came. And during Ramadan, Muslims fast. They will not eat or drink all day long. And at evening time, at sunset, then they will break the fast with a meal called an iftar. So Andy and Amy decide, hey, in our clinic, let, let's host an iftar. Let's host this meal for uh, patients and clinic workers that are here. And we just want to engage this culture in a culturally relevant way. And while they're doing this, you know, the men are in one room with Andy and the women are in another room with Amy, Amy noticed this young mother who just kept smiling at her. So she struck up a conversation and Amy started learning more about this uh, young woman. She had been working under the table as an accountant at the clinic to provide for her family, including a seven-year-old with autism. And as they talked and connected, they discovered a mutual friend, uh, a refugee who had a, 20 uh, a little baby boy with Down syndrome. And what's fascinating is that in this culture, they actually try to hide these kids. In general, they, you may not even know that that kid exists in that family. But here are these mothers who are courageously and boldly loving and being open about their special needs children. And Amy learned so much from these women's courageous love. She was inspired to keep serving and keep caring and keep connecting, but she never would have if she hadn't gained that insight into their hearts. So show hospitality, be ready, because you might break down a barrier and you might gain insight into people's hearts. Uh, the next letter of our acrostic is the letter T. When I was in medical school, uh, in my church where I attended there was a neurologist. And keep in mind, I, I've grown up in Washington State my whole life, went to UW for undergrad, never strayed far from home. So here I am in another state, in you know, another challenging environment, and I was so blessed that um, this doctor uh, introduced himself to me and said, hey, I'm, I mentor medical students, uh, would love to have you over to my home. Uh, you know, get to know my wife and kids and be encouraged. And so it became the start of a wonderful relationship. He would have four or five of us med students over regularly, and um, we'd just have these great discussions. He'd say, hey, how about we uh, read the book of James and discuss it next month? Or, hey, how about you read this Francis Schaeffer book and we'll discuss it the following month? It was so lively and engaging and, and encouraging, but at the same time, we're just getting to watch him and his wife and his kids love on each other, love on us. It was such a sweet family, such a loving home. And after several years of this, we each graduate, we move on to different residency programs around the country, but we still mail each other Christmas photos and cards, and I've been able to see each one of these young doctors start their families. And what I've noticed is what a striking resemblance each of us have now to that neurologist and his household how we've patterned our own families in the same way, how we've tried to, you know, some of us copy how they homeschool or other ones of us copy how they entertain, but in, any, in every way, we are transformed. And that's the letter T. We've been transformed by their hospitality. Um, four or five med students who are living differently because of the way that they demonstrated their faith in their home. Another beautiful example, um, comes from Ross Wright, the director of Hope and Home, which is a Christian foster care agency based out of Colorado Springs. Ross shared the story of a failed foster placement. There was a teenage girl uh, in the foster care system. She needed to be placed into a home. Uh, the state reaches out to Hope and Home, says, hey, do you have uh, a family, uh, somebody who can take in this teenage girl? And um, Right away, they, they start making phone calls, and, and a, a mom says, yes, yes, I will, I will take this single, this teenage girl into my house. And this foster mom tried really hard. You know, she was giving it all she had to, to try to earn this girl's trust, to try to be there for her. But the teenage girl was resisting, she was arguing, she was fighting, she ultimately ran away. And it left this foster mom in tears. Literally, the placement only lasted a few days, and the foster mom feels like a complete failure. 
And she doesn't quite know how the story ends, but years later, the teen has grown up. And, uh, sorry. And Ross Wright was having a conversation with her. Um, the girl was sharing about her dreams of starting a family and what life would be like and how she wanted her home to look. And as she's describing all of this to Ross, he's like, uh-huh, 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 wait a second. What she was describing, how she described her dream home, was exactly what that house was like, that that foster mom had cared for her in. This woman, in just a matter of days, had left such a positive impression on this teenager that years later, her dream, her desire, was to make her home just like this woman's home. You, you never know what impact you'll have. You'll never know how deeply and profoundly you might transform someone through showing hospitality. So, please, be open to breaking down barriers and seeing God work. Be open to gaining insight into people's hearts. Be open to witnessing the transformation of lives. And that brings us to our final letter of the acrostic. Some of you may know that we were blessed to adopt uh, James's, our son. Uh, James's biological mother actually reached out to us while we were caring for him in foster care. And we started sharing some pictures of him, and she would share pictures of his half-sister. You see, the point of foster care is to provide a safe home for children, and meanwhile, the parents are receiving resources with the ultimate goal of reuniting children with their parents. Uh, if that doesn't look like it can happen. A secondary goal is to give the children a safe place until they can be hopefully placed with some family, some kin. And as a very last resort, then permanency with an adoptive family uh, would be considered. And during this careful and very deliberate process, James's caseworker and, and guardian ad litem, that's his, his lawyer appointed by the government, they petitioned the court for termination of parental rights, and they advocated for me and Nancy to adopt him. It's, um, it's not a decision that's taken lightly, but uh, by God's grace, James's biological mother was very understanding and gracious through all of this, and she stayed in contact with us. About seven months after the adoption, she asked if we could meet up. She would love for the kids, these half-siblings, to have a play date together. And so we uh, scheduled a time, got together at a McDonald's, and um, that started more of the relationship. Eventually, she took a job in Oregon, uh, but she did fly back uh, for a visit, and uh, we picked her up at the airport. Actually brought her here to Southside, afterwards went out to Centennial Center Park and had a picnic together. And it was beautiful to watch Nancy have a conversation with this young lady and actually share the gospel with her right there on a park bench. You know, without hospitality, we would never have earned the chance to sit at that park bench with her. We would never have had the opportunity to speak to her, let alone present Christ to her. And that's what the letter E stands for, eternal consequences. Your hospitality can have an impact that lasts beyond this meal, beyond this lifetime. And I want to share a point of caution here, because we didn't go into this play date with a sales pitch in mind. And people are going to see that from a mile away. If your agenda is, I'm here just to convert you, how's the stake? Um, through hospitality, you know, it's like, likewise with that example I shared earlier, Professor Rosaria Butterfield going into the home of Pastor Ken Smith. She didn't feel like she was their project. Um, <clears throat> there's a proverb. Do not eat the bread of a man who is stingy. Do not desire his delicacies, for he is like one who is inwardly calculating. Eat and drink, he says to you, but his heart is not with you. Remember from Pastor's sermon on Romans 12.9, let love be genuine, let love be without hypocrisy. And that is where I want to caution each of us. Let our love, let our hospitality be genuine and be without hospitality, or it, it just, you'll fail miserably. Open with me to 1 Peter chapter 4, please. It's 
It's a parallel passage, if you will, to what we've been reading in Romans 12, 13. And uh, let's start in verse 7. We'll go through verse 9. 1 Peter chapter 4. The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So if Peter has to write this, if he has to say, show love show hospitality to one another without grumbling, what does that assume? That we're tempted to grumble. That we're tempted to be, oh, I cannot believe how much they are eating and drinking. When are these people leaving? <sighs> if you don't do this with the agape love that you get out of Romans 12, 12, you're going to grumble. That's why I opened with that. You can't live Romans 12, 13 without Romans 12, 12. You can't live it without as Peter said here too, an earnest love. So let's look at a more positive example. Flip on back to Genesis 18. Going way, way back. Genesis 18, please. And as you flip there, I want you to picture, if you will, um, a dignified, Middle Eastern, successful man, a leader, a respected one in his culture, uh, gray hair, honored, and successful, very wealthy. How should he behave? How should he conduct himself? And how does Abraham conduct himself? So let's read this passage. The Lord appeared to him by the oaks of Mamre as he sat at the door of his tent in the heat of the day. He lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, three men were standing in front of him. When he saw them, he, Abraham, ran from the tent door to meet them and bowed himself to the earth and said, O Lord, if I have found favor in your sight, do not pass by your servant. Let a little water be brought and wash your feet and rest yourselves under the tree while, while I bring a morsel of bread that you may refresh yourselves, and, and after that you may pass on, since you have come to your servant." It's the heat of the day. I don't run in the cool of the morning. <laughs> and here he is just embarrassing himself, getting out there, getting all hot and sweaty just to intercept these, these travelers and say, please, please, stay here. Let me serve you. I want you to see how sincere Abraham is in this and how he doesn't care about himself or his dignity or anything like that. And what does he do after that? And Abraham went quickly into the tent and said to Sarah, went to the tent to Sarah and said, quick, uh, the equivalent here is five gallons. Can you imagine a five gallon bucket of flour? He says, quick, take that much flour, knead it, make cakes. And at this point, the wives are all looking at their husbands like, uh-uh, no, 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 no. You did not just tell me to knead five gallons of flour. <sighs> But she does it. And then Abraham ran to the herd and took a calf, tender and good, and gave it to a young man who prepared it quickly. Honored men in that society do not run. Others come to them. Honored men in that society do not stand. They seat, at the sit of, sit in the seat of honor at the city gates. And others rise before them. And yet, what does Abraham do in this passage? It says, Abraham stood by them under the tree while they ate. It's like he's their waiter. Abraham utterly disregards his dignity. He goes out of his way to lavish hospitality on these mysterious visitors. It was costly. It was humbling. And Abraham showed no hesitation. Didn't care. He cared about them more than he cared about himself. And that's that agape love. Agape love cares about the other person. It's not what you can get out of it. So I urge you to be genuine and sincere in your hospitality. Look for an open door. Pray for an open door that you could share the gospel and then do it. Speak out of love because hospitality can have eternal consequences. Okay, since I have some extra time, I'll throw in another example. Um, let's open to Hebrews 13. I wasn't going to preach on this, but 
Lucky you. Um, Hebrews 13. Uh, verse, sorry, give me a second here. That's what I get for not being prepared, right? Okay, well, the verse is, do not neglect to show hospitality to strangers, for thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Verse 2, thank you, Pastor. 13, verse 2. You know, around the same time, right after Abraham was entertaining the Lord in this way, uh, the angels split off and went into the city of Sodom, where Lot Abraham's nephew was. And Lot didn't know it, but uh, everyone just assumed they were ordinary men passing through town. Lot didn't know they were there to rescue him, but he showed them hospitality. The, the Latin root for hospitality is the word hos- hospice. It can mean host, but it can also mean guest or visitor or stranger. It's the same sense where we get words like hostel, you know, some of you college kids going through Europe, staying in a hostel, or hospital where we can care for strangers and provide them with what they need. And here we are being urged in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 2, don't neglect to show hospitality to complete strangers. Thereby some have entertained angels unawares. Sixteen years ago, I had an encounter that haunts me to this day. I was on a medical missions trip. Uh, It was evening time, it was dark outside. I happened to be in our little guest house. And the rest of the the medical missions team, they were elsewhere at the moment. So I was there alone. And I hear this sound coming from the direction of the front door. And uh, I look to see this little African boy standing there, just outside the door. He, He didn't have a door to knock on, which is why he maybe cleared his throat or something to get my attention. So he was being very timid. But um, I'm like, man, this kid appeared out of nowhere. So I I walk up to the screen door, I don't open it, and I speak a little bit of French, uh, which is the official language of that country. So from what I can gather, he's telling me he's an orphan and he's asking for something. And I can still see his face. His expression was expectant, but not pushy. He was looking for help, but he didn't have like puppy dog eyes or anything melodramatic. It just, it was a very enigmatic facial expression. And I hesitated. I, my mind drew a blank. I, I, I didn't know what to do. I, I apologized that I had nothing to give, and I turned him away. He lingered a moment longer at the door, looked into my eyes with the same enigmatic facial expression, and then slowly I, I walked away, and eventually he did too. And later on that night, not long after that, I saw that boy join up with some other boys out in the the alleyway and and walk through the compound and head toward the exit. And I remember thinking, wait a second, how did they even get in through the gate? This was so unusual to me. And I began to question myself, why didn't I give him some food, a granola bar, anything, something that I had on hand? I I didn't show him any hospitality. And to this day, I, I wonder, 16 years later, did I miss an opportunity to show hospitality to a stranger, maybe entertaining angels underwear, I don't know. But please keep in mind, there are eternal consequences. Don't miss these chances. Because through hospitality, you might win a person's heart. You might get the chance to witness to them. Through hospitality, you could be entertaining angels, for all you know. But most importantly, through hospitality, you will be blessed by the Father. Let's open to Matthew 25. This is a very sobering passage, but also encouraging. Depends on which side you land on. Matthew chapter 25, let's uh, start in verse 31. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom 
prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me. Naked, and you did not clothe me. Sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? Then he will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. Which one of us is sufficient for this? Which one of us can bear the weight of this? This responsibility, this heavy calling to minister to the least of Christ's servants. Only, only if you have that agape love that comes from God. Only if your hope is in the future, not this life. Only if you can be patient under tribulation. Only if you are fueled by prayer and the Holy Spirit can you even be able to give a cup of water. Because short of that, all our righteous deeds are just filthy rags. We can't love this way. We can't serve this way. It's not in us, but it's in him. Let's look at how Jesus initiated, and let's look at how Jesus finished. For the initiation, I want you to turn to Romans chapter 3. Romans chapter 3, starting in verse 15. This is his letter to the church in Laodicea. I know your works. You are neither hot nor cold. Would that you were either hot or cold, cold or hot. So because you are lukewarm and neither hot or cold, I will spit you out of my mouth. For you say, I am rich, I have prospered, and I need nothing. Not realizing that you are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, and naked. This is a very, very good description of all of us before we met Christ. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined by fire so that you may be rich and white garments so that you may clothe yourself and the shame of your nakedness may not be seen and salve to anoint your eyes so that you may see. Those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So he, so reprove and discipline, so be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. The one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on his throne. So the Laodicean church, they are wretched, pitiable, poor, blind, naked. They have a meal with Jesus and then they're sitting on the throne with him. Waiter, I'll have what they're having. (laughs) But seriously, though, it's not what you eat. It's who you eat with. This was all because of Jesus initiating. He was the one who knocked on the door. Was there a barrier between you and God once upon a time? Yes, there was. It's called sin. And you couldn't do a thing about it. But Jesus broke down that barrier. And your your hearts were just so locked up. 
you thought you could hide and God couldn't see, but he, he got insight into your heart. He knew everything you'd never confessed. And he, he won his way into your heart. He knocked on that door. And though you were wretched and pitiable and poor and blind and naked, he transformed you. You're not who you used to be if you're a son of God, if you're a daughter of God, because of Jesus' hospitality. And your eternal consequences, they're not the same. You're going to eternally be seated with him on the throne, just as he has been seated with the Father. Jesus invited you out for a bite. Now what are you going to do? I'm going to carefully make some practical suggestions on ways to show hospitality. This list is by no means exhaustive, and it is no means prescriptive. I just want to throw out some ideas and stimulate some thought for you. The purpose of this is not to give you a to-do list. I hope that it is inspiring and stimulating, as the Bible says, spur one another on to good deeds. But please, please, please do not miss the point. This is not a to-do list, and if you check it off, God is pleased. No. God, in his mercy, was pleased to save you. And now you get to try out some of these. In our church, for example, we've had meal trains for sick or suffering believers. And I remember recently there was another meal train set up for the Steffens, and before I could even log in, it was already filled up. So bless you guys, you rock. You know, continue. And if you haven't tried that yet, try to elbow out somebody in line and get up, get up there and share a meal. How about inviting people to eat with you? And you might say, oh, my home's too small. Okay, how about a backyard barbecue? How about meeting at a restaurant? Doesn't matter. Find something. Go to a park. Um, visiting the sick. One of our dear brothers here at Southside was dying of cancer, and the call went out. He didn't want to die alone. Would people from Southside take turns visiting with him and sitting with him? And our family was blessed with the opportunity to do that. How about hosting missionaries when they're on furlough? Um, David Chandler was pointing out from a recent article that the missions board was emailing and discussing about uh, the experiences missionaries and missionary kids have coming back to the U.S. He said one point in that article is particularly painful, that of churches that aren't really welcoming. I thank God that Southside is extraordinary in this regard. Our furloughed missionaries do not lack for lodging, meals, or even vehicles, but this is sadly not the ordinary experience. Our missionary friends in Peru, upon returning for a few months in the States, bought an SUV large enough to put a mattress in the back because their supporting churches often do not even offer them lodging when they visit. The thought of them spending the night in the back of their van in a church parking lot breaks my heart. Yet, they do not complain and would remind us that our Lord often had no pillow. Here's another way that you could be meeting the needs of the saints or contributing to the needs of Christians fleeing persecution. Maybe they're living in refugee camps, like my dad, who was sick with malaria, or like any other of the stories we hear today about Christians being driven out and living in squalor, waiting with no end in sight. How can you be financially giving? How can you be going? I remember Pastor Ray talking about the churches in Syria dealing with so many broken hearts and they said, don't send money, send people to help show compassion. Because here are these pastors day and night pouring out their hearts, and if they could just have someone else come alongside and, and help share that burden of hearing someone's story, of praying with them, of grieving with them, that would help share the burden and lift that compassion fatigue. How about giving financially or going personally to feed and clothe and shelter the saints? Or reaching out to strangers what the Bible calls strangers or sojourners. Uh, I know a man in St. Louis, we went to church together. He had this passion for going out uh, to Bosnia. He wanted to be a missionary there to the Bosnian people. Yet for various reasons, God never opened that door for him. And he didn't quite know why until years later when God showed him, did you know that the largest population of Bosnians outside of Bosnia is St. Louis? 
That's where a lot of these refugees had settled. And all of a sudden, he had Bosnia at his doorstep, and he started to minister to these refugees and build relationships with them, and he would provide practical help. Some of them needed help finding jobs. He would provide even providential help. One day he was driving and said, oh, you know what, I'm going to pull in here. I know some people, some refugees there. I'll just check and see how they're doing. They said, oh, we're so glad you came. Just now we had this appointment we had to get to. We had no idea how we'd get there. We're so glad. Could you give us a ride? And of course he did. And so on. And then at Christmas time, giving gifts to them and using that as an opportunity to tell them about Jesus, the greatest gift of all. So there are people that God has placed right in front of us that we can be ministering to. You don't have to travel across an ocean. You might just have to travel across the street. Another example, uh, Andy and Amy, who I told you about, they heard through some of the people they minister to that the United States has started a program called the Welcome Corps. You know, you've heard of the Peace Corps or the Army Corps of Engineers. This is the Welcome Corps, and it is intended so that people can team up in groups of at least five and say, we will sponsor refugees. We will provide some of the financial outlay to get them immigrated and then you know, commit to ministering alongside them, helping them get established, letting them feel welcome, answering their questions, meeting their needs in practical ways. Can you imagine the witness that that would have? I'm not endorsing this specific program. I'm just throwing it out as suggestions. I just heard about it, just looked into it, but it's something to consider. And another practical way would be foster care. Even if you yourself don't feel led to foster children in your home, I want you to seriously consider how you can partner with and support those who do. Because foster care is enormously demanding of your compassion and your time, and it places unique stresses on your family. And if you, I remember just one day, Megan Dix, bless her, she, she picked up our son James and took him for a play date with her kids so that we could focus on the three other foster kids we had in the house at the moment, and that was just a breath of life into our home. Little practical things like that can make all the difference. I'm going to move on to a warning and close with an encouragement. The warning is that hospitality will cost you. Intentionality, doing these things, it takes time. I gave you the example of my friend Mike and ministering to refugees in St. Louis. He builds relationships over months of visits. Or the example we shared earlier of Ken and Floyd having Rosaria Butterfield over to their home, meal after meal after meal. That takes time. It also takes money. I remember Mike let a refugee's daughter, she wanted to learn to drive. She wanted to earn her driver's license. So he's like, oh, okay, let's go out in my car. You can practice driving. She almost totaled his car. And can you imagine the financial loss there? But I want you to be aware there will be potential hits to your pocketbook. Are you ready for this? How about your health? I remember when I was doing a missions trip in Cambodia, we'd held this clinic for some Vietnamese refugees out in a village, and afterwards the, the village leader really wanted to, to have us into his home and, and set the best he could before us. So, so we're sitting down on the floor, and, and he's putting out this plate of, of vegetables, and I'm just... Mah, mah, mah. Raw vegetables, I'm going to get enteritis. This is so dangerous, I can't eat this. But it would be an insult not to. He's doing the best he can for us, so... Yes, I ate the food. And you've got to ask yourself, what can I endure for the sake of the gospel? Will I be willing even to get sick for the sake of the gospel? What might I get exposed to if I go serve in a malaria-infested refugee camp? You don't know. You don't know. There's danger. There's risk. And then there's the emotional hurt. We, we can be hurt by anybody, but the deepest hurts come from those we open up to. If you invite someone into your home, if you start building a relationship with them, and they someday betray you, it will hurt way more than anyone else that you've kept at arm's length could ever have hurt you. Psalm 41.9, even my close friend in whom I trusted, who ate my bread, has lifted up his heel against me. That's like the deepest insult possible. That is the deepest betrayal possible. And Jesus experienced that from us. And that's where I want to go to in closing. Yes, hospitality might cost you, but Jesus showed hospitality, and it cost him everything. We talked about time, money, health, emotional hurt. T 
time. Jesus spent his entire life on earth here for us. Money, Colossians, uh, 2 Corinthians 8, 9, for you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sake he became poor, so that you, by his poverty, might become rich. How about health? What did Jesus give up health-wise? Um, his life? Yeah, he gave up a lot. Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. And emotional hurt. Let's look at Matthew 26. Truly, I say to you, one of you will betray me. And they were very sorrowful and began to say to him, one of another, is it I, Lord? He answered, he who has dipped his hand in the dish with me will betray me. How much do you have to trust someone to let them dip their chicken nugget in your sauce? That's how much Jesus trusted each of these men. And every single one of them abandoned him, and one of them straight up betrayed him. That was not to guilt trip you. That was not to say, yes, hospitality would cost you, but it cost Jesus more, therefore suck it up. No, that is not my point. I want you to know that Jesus initiated hospitality that saved your life. Jesus paid for the hospitality that saved your life. I want you to be inspired, not guilt-tripped. So let's finish with John 13, which I think will be the finest inspiration I can give you. John chapter 13. As we read this, I want you to get one point. And that is what empowered Jesus to do what he's about to do here. If you get that, then you get Romans 12, 12. And you will be able to live Romans 12, 13. Now, before the feast of pa the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. It is the ultimate act of hospitality. These men have been trampling around in dirty streets with refuse and dust and dung encrusted all over their toes and under their sandals. This is the kind of service that Jewish hosts are expected to somehow provide, at the very least put out water. If you have a servant do it, it is the absolute lowliest servant who will do it. And Jesus himself can do this without guilt tripping, without sulking, without humble bragging, none of that. Why? Verse 3, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands and that he had come from God and was going back to God. When you know who you are, when you know whose you are, there is no act of service that's beneath you. There is no gift that you can give that's too pricey for you. Because you know your eternity. Jesus did. And Jesus could love and serve to that degree. And Southside, I pray... Pray that any act of hospitality you show will be rooted in that. Please don't even try to show hospitality until you get that. But if you do, every, every single act will be a glory to God. Every single bit of service, every single cup of water that you give, you're doing it for the king. You're doing it for the king. Let's pray. Oh, Jesus, I pray that the words 
that have gone out today would not ring hollow, that they would not fall on deaf ears. I pray that your spirit would make that seed grow into fruit that bears eternal life, that we would be men and women eternally transformed by you, and that in turn we would, in your name, show love, meet the needs of the saints, and seek to show hospitality so that others can be blessed and that you can be honored. Oh God, I pray. I pray that we would not take up these acts as a to-do list. I pray that we would not try to manufacture righteous deeds by our own strength because we'll just end up grumbling. But no, God, only by your spirit, only by your love, only by your transformation, only by you setting us on a new eternal trajectory can any of us even hope to give a cup of water. Jesus, please, you who washed our feet, make our hearts clean that we can serve you. In Jesus' name, amen.